Hello everybody and welcome to the next recording of our working group meeting on mathematical optimization and quantum computing. Have fun watching our videos. In this episode, you watch the presentation from David Bernal. All right, then welcome back to our session. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to introduce now next uh, David Bernal. Um, he's working as a PhD candidate at Carnegie Carnegie Mellon University, and he worked there in various areas, but as well as process systems engineering. And there he often faces nonlinear problems that he needs to solve. And now today he will present of what he calls the modern computational approaches to solve such nonlinear problems uh, that occur there. Over to you, David, and thanks for being here. All right, thank you. Um, so first of all, if my internet is lagging, please let me know and I'll turn off the camera. In the meantime, let's just keep going this way. Uh, thank you for those of you organizing the, the, the session. And uh, also thank you to the previous speakers who are going to save me a lot of time since they have already covered several topics that I was going to touch upon this time. So let's, let's get started, right? And uh, actually based on the first uh, part of this meeting where we saw that the background of the people mainly attending this is mathematical optimization. I think you will, you will enjoy and resonate with the way that I will present this material. So let's get started. And uh, I guess that a very good starting point is to ask ourselves, well, why are we here, right? We are trying to solve real world problems, looking for optimal solutions, but obviously doing this uh, experimentally, so to say, is expensive, prone to errors. Therefore, we do like uh, having a model of this real world that balances tractability and validity, incorporates assumptions, just boils down our understanding of, of the real world, right? And then a useful paradigm to find these uh, this optimal solutions is math programming, right? So in mathematical programming, we like putting stuff in terms of mathematical equations where we have objectives and constraints all with respect to certain variables. And that's the way how we are going to approach our optimization problems in practice. So once you start wondering why, what do we need to model the real world, you need to also acknowledge that the real world is abrupt, non-convex, discontinuous, non-smooth. Therefore, this is where this toolkit of integer or mixed integer programming comes very handy. So when you force certain variables to only take discrete values, you can have like this universal tool kit to model non-convexities and discontinuities. And obviously this kind of condition arises naturally from let's say indivisibility. So you cannot talk about 2.7 shoes, uh, but also mainly it comes as triggers or switches to implement disjunctions, implications, and many other logical constraints that, we, that appear all over the place in decision-making. So this is the, the tool, that we are going to use to model the real world, right? But once you start thinking, okay, if I want to model the real world, a part of being abrupt, it's nonlinear by nature, right? I mean, you can encode uh, your knowledge using nonlinear equations more efficiently as with only discrete variables. So this uh, assumption that you can write down the constraints or objectives as a linear combination of the variables in your problem uh, doesn't hold in general, right? And this is good from the modeling point of view, bad from the solving point of view, because this only makes our problem harder to solve. So we're all invested in trying to find ways of addressing this kind of, this kind of challenging problems. For those of you that are more in the optimization community, the way that we know these nonlinear discrete optimization problems is usually as mixed integer nonlinear programs, right? Where we have linear and nonlinear constraints and variables that can take uh, continuous and discrete values. So where I'm, I'm coming from a process systems engineering background. So this is basically uh, optimization methods applied to chemical engineering. And there are several applications all over the place in my field itself from for this minor piece. So process flow sheet optimization, uh, process operation, process control, and molecular design. But certainly the, the applications, they go well beyond process systems engineering, and you have applications in medicine, in other branches of engineering, such as civil engineering in this case, uh, operations research in general, computational biology, uh, network design. So this, this kind of modeling framework appear, appears all over the place, right? 
And once you start thinking, what kind of problems can I encode in this particular uh, approach? The answer, the short answer is every problem, right? And the, the reason is that you can encode even universal Turing machines as this mix into your nonlinear programs, right? So if you are joining this talk and you're hearing what I have just said, you would be wondering, okay, how is this possible, right? How is this guy coming up to us, telling us that he has like this universal tool to solve all the possible problems? Why haven't I used this before? Why haven't I uh, heard of this before? And the catch is that solving these problems is hard. Uh, I mean, in terms of complexity theory, you can prove that they are MP hard. And even there are some cases that become undecidable. So these are challenging optimization problems. But because of the many, many applications that you can you can pose uh, through these tools, we're interested in solving them in any case, right? So how do we solve these problems? Um, someone who's not, uh, who's just entering the field might come, might go ahead and say, okay, well, you have a set of discrete variables. Mm, it's a finite set. So why don't you take all the different combinations, right? You go and evaluate whether each combination satisfies the um, constraints, then you rank them according to the objective and you're done, right? Well, that unfortunately is not practical. And the reason is that the number of possible solutions grows extremely fast, exponentially fast. Uh, so in the best case scenario, it grows as two to the N and in other kinds of applications such as assignment problems, which are kinds of problems that we deal on a regular basis, uh, they grow even faster as in factorial. So enumerating is not a practical way of approaching this, these problems. We still need to solve them though, right? So let me go. Do you, is it okay for you to be interrupted in between if there's a question? Absolutely, like... absolutely. Okay, My just pleasure. wanted to check. Cool. So there's Adam Reichold who uh, raised his hand. Um, would you like to ask the question? Okay, then sorry for that. That was not intended. Okay, go ahead. No, no <laughs> problem. I, I also have fat fingers. So, anyways, um, so how do we how do we actually solve these problems in practice, right? So there is one method called the branch and bound method. For those of you that are familiar, basically you start by solving uh, what we call the continuous relaxation of the problem. We forget about the fact that some of the variables need to take discrete values. So you solve this continuous optimization problem, which is easier to solve in the linear case. It even becomes polynomial uh like a problem uh a polynomial problem and then you start enforcing the discrete value of the variables in this computer science tree which grows uh downwards uh such that you can apply this divide and conquer idea hopefully uh this technique has been enhanced by at every single one of these leaf nodes you can try to derive extra constraints uh, that people in the community like to call cuts to avoid the worst case scenario, where the worst case scenario is basically that you open every single separation and you end up enumerating every single one of the of the options, as I showed in the previous in the previous slide. So, how good is this? Extremely good for the linear case, right? I mean, we this ha this is the the main the key technology in the in very efficient codes that are available out there. Uh, it has been extremely successful. Only in terms of algorithmic speed up, you can count up to 150K uh, improvement in the last 30 years. So we have gotten fairly good at solving uh, mixed integer linear programs. You can also apply the branch and bound techniques for the nonlinear uh, case. It hasn't been as successful though. So another kind of approach that we can take to solve these problems is through decomposition methods. So what are these decomposition methods? Basically we're gonna take advantage of the, of the success in solving, let's say, subdivisions of these problems. And we are gonna use that for our own advantage. So by breaking down cleverly the original problem and solving the sub pieces with a specialized methods. So in this case, with MILP solvers, which we see that are very efficient, we can sort of harvest the improvements in the other areas of optimization. So let me dig in a little bit closer into this. Uh, there is another key observation that says, 
look, if you fix or basically project down the, your problem to a subset of the variables, in this case, uh, all those that are not discrete, you end up with a continuous optimization problem, which you can address way more efficiently. And given a sort of hand wavy argument in terms of complexity, if you are dealing with an MP problem, uh, you rather solve several times problems of a fraction of the size that only once the big problem, right? That, that, I know it's a little bit hand wavy, but it gives you a little bit of intuition on why do these methods work. You might uh, want to iteratively solve sub problems and you prefer that than solving the original problem once. And one of the most successful algorithms to deal with this nonlinear dis uh, discrete optimization problems is called the outer approximation method. So that method basically breaks down the discrete mixed integer nonlinear program into a discrete linear program and a continuous nonlinear problem. And then by iterating the solution of these two, you can find the optimal solution of these problems. This, this was um, uh, an algorithm proposed back in the 80s uh, from my research group, uh, the one that I belong at, at Carnegie Mellon. And well, it still shows up in many of the approaches out there. So this is a kind of a weird presentation where I introduce myself in the middle of it instead of the beginning. So who am I? I'm David Bernal. I'm doing my PhD at Carnegie Mellon at this uh, research group of Professor Ignacio Grossman. My background is both in chemical engineering and in physics, right? And throughout my PhD, I have had the chance of doing um, some, some internships at different companies. Uh, one of them was ExxonMobil Research and Engineering, uh, twice actually. And then I was part of the so-called NASA, the Feynman Quantum Academy. So this was a fellowship that allowed me to go to NASA quantum uh, to the NASA and quantum artificial intelligence laboratory and work with them on some of these problems. Through my PhD, basically, we are being funded through uh, several uh, industrial collaborations. So I have had the chance to interact uh, through the the center that I belong to, which is the CAPD, the Center of Advanced Process Decision Making, and I have been involved in several applications in refinery optimization process intensification, maintenance optimization, and so forth. And the applications have even gone beyond uh, chemical engineering or process systems engineering. The one particular case has to do with the compilation of quantum annealers. So I have been working on the theory uh, software in, of these discrete nonlinear optimization problems. And a good way of summarizing what I like doing is I like just going out there, finding cool math tools to try to address these problems more efficiently. So I don't know, conic programming, algebraic geometry are some of the stuff that I have been doing. More recently though, thanks to that experience at NASA, I started some these new research on quantum optimization models and algorithms. So basically we are reaching the point and, and I think that this will be highlighted more in the talks tomorrow that we already have some devices available that we can use and we're starting to ask and answer questions such as how should we try to encode our optimization problems for these new quantum computers, right? I mean, the previous talk basically covered that in depth. That's something that I'm very interested in. So uh, we will talk about that later. So my quote unquote past research has to do with contributions to, to discrete nonlinear optimization. So we started with some, with some benchmark study that classified the, the very different approach. Well, actually they are not very different, but there are several approaches to address these problems in practice. One of them is actually provided by FICO, uh, the Solver Express. And the main outcome here is that there is still a big gap between what we can model and what we can solve, right? I, that 30 year old algorithm, people are still looking into it. It's the, it's the key algorithm in most of the solvers that, that are available out there. And I have been working on algorithmic improvement and software implementations. I have been working in implementing those algorithms for both commercial and open source software. So uh, that's pretty much in terms of applications, I don't know, distributed manufacturing. This is a more engineering uh, slide. So forgive, forgive me for, for showing a little bit of applications here but we were working on coming up with algorithms for distributed manufacturing, catalytic distillation, 
refinery operations and maintenance optimization. So I would certainly love to spend the remaining of my time talking about all these applications, but the workshop is on quantum methods, right? So let's uh, shift gears and move into quantum, right? And then let's go into the history of physics, which is something that I, I really like. And it's a nice way of introducing this, this, this topic. So um, the way I see this, this whole thing started with the observation in the late 1800s by Pierre Curie, who realized that when you have a magnet and you heat it up, it suddenly stops being a magnet, right? Uh, so people in physics call this a phase transition. It's an extremely weird behavior if you think about it, right? Why would the, 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 um, the normal behavior of a system change so drastically since the usual uh, normal behavior of things is determined by the least energy state. That they, this is a really, a really deep question, right? If you think about it, and then you can start trying to build a mental model of this. So let's assume, oops, all right. Let's assume that, uh, I don't know if, well, the figure on the left is, is a representation of this magnet, right? And you have tiny particles, which can be magnetized north or south. Right, and they can only take these two discrete values. Let's say north is green, south is red, and we will all agree that this is mostly green. Therefore, this would represent a system that is magnetized. Right, that in in so, the sum of the of the magnetization is is mainly po pointing north. So this is a magnet, and somehow once you start increasing the temperature, uh, some of these greens flip to red and you end up with as many greens as reds. Therefore, in average, this is no longer a magnet. So that's the mental model that actually Lentz developed in the 1920s. His student Ising uh, solved the one dimensional case analytically, also gave the name of this model to the Ising or the Ising model. Uh, and it's basically a model that has neighbor to neighbor interactions for each one of these discrete uh points and basically what defines the behavior of the whole system is the minimization of the energy that you can again write as a quadratic term of neighbor to neighbor interactions and a linear term which is the interaction with uh in physics people call it an external field so later on sager uh showed the analytical solution to the 2d case in the 2000s it was proved that you cannot analytically solve the three-dimensional case uh, actually, it was the way that this was proved, it was by showing an equivalence to a combinatorial optimization problem, which is the Max Scott problem. So in terms of physics, this is really important because it was the, the, the first step towards this notion of universality, where systems with the same number of dimensions and symmetries, they go through identical phase transitions. So, and the, the Ising model is the simplest model in the theory space that you can uh show phase transitions therefore we can start trying to explain i don't know common objects such as water or magnets right in the framework of optimization though uh, this is also very interesting because if you think about it uh this is a discrete nonlinear optimization problem right which kind well if you transform these minus one plus one variables into zero ones you end up with only binary variables no continuous or no integers if the nonlinearity is only reduced to quadratics and you have no constraints you end up with a quadratic unconstrained binary optimization a cubal and this is obviously a subcase of MINLP. so now that we have this common framework how do we solve it so let's keep looking into the history of physics and maybe see if there's there is something in there and then we have the the adiabatic uh, hypothesis from albert einstein which basically says that if you have a quantum system and you affect it on an adiabatic fashion without interactions with the environment in terms of heat or, or other kinds of interactions, every single motion is allowed. How can we use this to solve these problems? Well, you can come up with something called the quantum adiabatic algorithm. And this is just a property of the Schrodinger equation. So let me, let me explain it to you. You have a system, you allow quantum interactions to, to work on it. And then the system is sitting at a state that is well-defined. Its energy is well-defined and it has a ranking among all the possible energies that that system can obtain. 
let's assume it's sitting on its lowest energy state, right? Then you close the box, you allow the system to evolve adiabatically. So hopefully zero Kelvin on temperature, no measurement, no interaction with the environment. And you transform that system into another one. I mean, just shift it slowly enough. Once you open the box and look how the energy is sitting at that final system, what is preserved is the ranking of the energy state. So if you started at the lowest energy state, you will end up at the lowest energy state of this new system if you affected it adiabatically. And then if you think about it, this is the base of the algorithms that we're gonna use through quantum computing to address optimization problems, right? How do we do this? I mean, the, the, the talk by Elizabeth was wonderful in this case because she went through the whole mapping, but just to, just to summarize it very briefly, you take an optimization problem that you're interested at, you map it into an energy function that which is gonna be the final one that you are going to evolve to. Then you have another state, which is easy to set up and you know its lowest energy state, then you evolve this easy to set up system that you know its lowest energy state into the problem that you're interested at. And then basically nature is gonna give you, I mean, you can in being a little bit more, more, um, more precise, mathematically speaking, you can approach uh, arbitrarily close to a probability of one of finding the lowest energy state of that final system. So this is extremely interesting if you think about it. We, and we're just talking about a, a property of the way that quantum systems evolve, which is described through Schrodinger's equation. So how do we do this in practice? If we think about this, uh, there, uh, there are like two big approaches to um, quantum optimization at this point through these derived from the adiabatic quantum algorithm. So one of them is quantum annealers. We have talked, we have seen a lot during this talk, but a way of understanding them is that they are like a finite temperature implementation of this quantum adiabatic algorithm, right? You cannot go down to zero Kelvin, but you can try really hard and the D-wave devices, they work at 15 millikelvin and they try to evolve these systems slowly enough to go and, and follow this quantum adiabatic pathway, right? The other way is on gate-based computers. So these are the computers uh, that, for example, earlier we were being told from IBM, Google, other companies that are building these kind of things. And there are algorithms. So again, you can implement algorithms in, in these computers through quantum operators that people call gates, right? And um, the two best known algorithms there are the QAOA, Quantum Approximate Optimization ANSATS, actually it's not, and the Variational Quantum Eigen Solvers. And I don't have the time to go in detail into these algorithms, but a nice way of understanding them is that you can see them as a discretized version of the adiabatic pathway. So you want to go from this initial superposition to the optimal solution. The adiabatic pathway is giving you this nice smooth uh, way that you can transform your system. And these QAOA and VQE algorithms are just doing discrete steps, trying to follow this adiabatic pathway. So that's a, that's a, a very high level, nice way of understanding this under the same framework. So a question that everyone in practice should have is, okay, cool, cool story. Um, does this work? I mean, we, we go through, we, we already know how to address these problems using, uh, I mean, we can all write a, a quadratic unconstrained binary optimization problem and you can use methods to solve that. Uh, branch and bound, decomposition, whatever, what I was talking about. So do these quantum methods actually work? And uh, let's go step by step. On quantum annealing, you, uh, I have these results from a study from the people at Los Alamos. So on the y-axis, you have the optimality gap, which is just a measure of how good your solution is gonna be, the lower, the better. And on the x-axis, you have the runtime on a logarithmic scale. And for those of you that are familiar with, um, let's say classical uh, integer programming, you might recognize these two blue lines because they correspond to one of the leading solvers out there, which is called Groby. And you can write 
these quadratic unconstrained binary optimization problems either as a linear version or a quadratic version. And you can see that these problems, you can, you can solve them fairly efficiently classically. But if we zoom into this part, the green line is the quantum annealer. So you're getting solutions, way better solutions in orders of magnitude faster time. So if you're an optimization expert, you're going to stop me on my tracks and you're going to say, wait a second, this is a heuristic. You're comparing a heuristic against, a, um, let's say, a complete algorithm. It, the comparison is not fair. You can argue. So the other four lines in this plot are classical heuristics. So you, we, we are already getting to that point. You are going to say, hey, wait, you're limited by connectivity and size and all that, which is true, right? But at the very least, it's interesting because in this particular kind of realms, they seem to be unbeatable. So on the other hand, for QAOA, for these gate-based computers, since the size of those computers is even more limited, the amount of experimental work is rather small. But in theory, uh, you have, and, and maybe, yeah, that's a figure of speech. So theoretically speaking, you have, uh, ways to show that these algorithms are extremely promising. And one case is with QAOA, that's an approximation algorithm. So for those of you that are not familiar, approximation algorithms are algorithms that for a family of problems, they are designed to run fast and they can maybe not give you always the optimal solution, but they have some kind of uh, mathematical guarantees. They tell you, look, if I try to solve a problem from this family, I will give you a solution within 80% of the true optimal solution, guaranteed, right? That's called the approximation ratio, that 80% that I was telling you about. So, and in particular, QAOA proved at the point, at the moment that it was um, proposed, proved a better approximation ratio than any classical algorithm, any classical approximation algorithm for a particular kind of, of combinatorial optimization problem. So these are super interesting facts from the theoretical perspective. What I want, the message that I want you to take home from this slide is that it's interesting to start looking into these methods, either annealing practically speaking or gate-based theoretically speaking. So um, I also need, I, 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 uh, this is the, the slide that creates the most uh, opinions from, from my talk which is the state of the affairs, how I see the field moving. And it's, I'm constantly updating the, the date and usually the numbers here because this field is moving extremely fast. But I would claim that there are only few limited quantum speed up demos, right? Achieved through quantum annealing. So most of them are tailored for the actual chip and everything. So, and by speed up, I mean comparing the classical alternative with the quantum alternative. There is in my opinion, no such thing as quantum advantage yet. So quantum advantage is uh, a term where you have a pro an application problem where the quantum method is considerably better than any alternative, any classical alternative. And this, in my opinion, hasn't been obtained yet. What we have seen though, is these papers from quantum supremacy, the first one from Google, the second one, from the people at China with their Yuzhang computer. And these are indeed quantum supremacy experiments, right? You prove that it would have been crazy to perform the kind of computation that they did on those quantum computers on a classical hardware. But in my opinion, those, I would classify them as self-simulation. So the kind of computation that they were doing was uh, actually describing the quantum state of the computer itself. Whether that's useful or not, there is people that claim that you can start generating truly random numbers out of this. But in my opinion, it doesn't yet count as an application. Obviously, you know, there was a lot of drama between Google initially saying that doing what they did in five minutes in their computer would take 10,000 years on a classical computer. IBM rebuked that uh, days after uh, saying that it should be days instead of instead of years. Still, days is orders of magnitude larger than minutes. So quantum supremacy is, is still holds, right? What I would like to 
say though is that there is a word quest to find this quantum advantage right and as of last year, $22 billion were invested worldwide into finding interesting applications for quantum computing, right? I don't know, Germany, $3.1 billion, 2.6 billion euros as of 2020. So I think that it's interesting for us to get into this work. Um, again, I'm coming from a chemical engineering department. So some of you might not be interested in this, but I still need to mention that. So I, I was invited to write a paper on the perspectives of quantum computing for chemical engineering. And we basically identified three pillars where this thing pays off. Uh, for us, we care about simulating chemistry, right? And uh, as previously said, what better way, simulating quantum mechanics classically is really hard. So why don't you have a quantum a computer that actually follows the, the rules of quantum mechanics to perform that simulation? That's called quantum chemistry. And that's super interesting for us chemical engineers. Uh, we have machine learning, right? So machine learning, it's, it's, it, it stands in between two, these two big pillars. One of them is that the way that we try to simulate um, molecules right now is through machine learning trained models. And those need a lot of data. And that data is expensive to get on an experimental basis. So if you have a way of very accurately simulating quantum mechanics, AKA a quantum computer, then you could generate those training sets for those, for the methods. They are called density functional theory uh, methods. Another side is the training task itself. So you can always pose training tasks in machine learning as optimization problems. And if you happen to accelerate those, you will be able to perform machine learning faster. So that's the third pillar, which is optimization. And here I would classify in two big groups. One of them is for continuous optimization. So in continuous optimization, especially in convex optimization, we have, been, uh, we have seen proposals on people trying to accelerate, I don't know, the simplex method for uh, linear programming or interior point methods for general convex optimization problems. And the, the key of this is that uh, at some point, you need to solve a system of linear equations uh, in the Newton update and, and all that stuff. And uh, there is a proposed algorithm that under very strict conditions and whether you're measuring or not, we can talk about that more in detail, proposes exponential speed up in solving systems of linear equations. So they are pro the, the proposals on, on continuous optimization stem from there. They are mostly theoretical, but they are certainly interesting. On the other hand, we have combinatorial optimization, which is what we have pretty much been talking uh, today about, which is mapping discrete variables into um, spins and discrete energy states, qubits, and then running algorithms based on adiabatic quantum computation to, to find minimal energies, right? So you can see that these areas are, are related to one another. Going back to optimization, combinatorial optimization in general, I would like to draw the following picture. So on the, on the left-hand side, we have on the classical method side of things, we have methods based on divide and conquer, branch and bound methods. They are, they are really efficient codes out there to address these kind of problems. But at the end of the day, the, the problem is that their worst case scenario is that they go into this exponential complexity of enumerating all the solutions. So that's, that's problematic. Uh, on the other hand, we have these quantum methods, which are based on least energy principles with these variational algorithms. From an optimization perspective, these are heuristics. They don't have uh, guarantees to reach the global optimal solution. Uh, they are very limited in terms of the hardware sizes, but as I try, uh, hopefully I convince you this far that they are interested to look into because they have the potential of giving us some very desired speed up in addressing this kind of problems. Non-exponential, by the way, we can talk about complexity later, but it's not gonna be exponentially faster. Um, so here, this goes back to my present research, which happens to have 
and at the simultaneously with my past research on quantum optimization. So the reason why the why uh, they brought me into NASA was to address that embedding problem that Elizabeth was was uh, telling us earlier today. I, actually, I I I really wish I had seen that presentation before my time at NASA. That would have saved me so much time. It it was a very nice a very nice way of presenting this. Um, the way that we actually it, back then I uh, the the the, um, the relationship between let's say combinatorial optimization and quantum computing in my case was the opposite. I was using combinatorial optimization methods to address a problem relevant to quantum computing. Um, so that, that's the first part. Then we started working with some colleagues at the University of Lehigh on answering how would you encode uh, stable set problems or max k colorable, colorable subgraph problems into quantum annealers, right? And how can we better encode these constraints? Because that's that's a complicating factor and we will talk about that later. Um, so we, we had some nice um, some nice results over here. And then this also, I mean, the, the, the third part here also wants to highlight a problem that I see it's happening in quantum computing, which is the hype, right? It sounds so good that people often fall in overselling this kind of technology and we need to be extremely careful with the claims that we're making. So <laughs> the first scene of this story is this note that came out recently where it said that IBM and ExxonMobil are building quantum algorithms to, to solve this giant computing problem, right? So you would say, oh boy, okay, th this is huge, right? This was based on some news outlet on a Medium article uh, written by IBM Research where they were talking about the project that I was involved in, in trying to write um, routing problems as cubos and solving them either well, actually, in that in that paper was only on on uh, IBM IBM devices, right? And ExxonMobil cares about this because they have this huge logistic network of moving natural gas around the world. But we were not solving the actual big problem. Actually, for those of you that are, that are into logistics, this is the size of the problem that we were solving. So the leap between this and a giant computing problem is humongous, right? So we need to be also very careful on how we sell this kind of technology. Try not to oversell it, try not to feed the hype. Okay, cool. So uh, this slide is here uh, to answer the question, what else can we do? And maybe um, touching upon uh, several points relevant to quantum computing, which is Anything cold and small enough behaves according to quantum mechanics. Therefore, if you were able to control a system that is small enough to behave according to quantum mechanics, you would have a practical quantum computer. We are at a stage where there is not a consensus of which technology needs to be used to represent a quantum computer, right? So we have different approaches. So we have cold atoms with the people at Honeywell, IonQ, and so forth. We have people with superconducting qubits, which we were told uh, earlier, uh, that's the approach from IBM with their Joseph film junctions. Also D-Wave falls into this category. Uh, people at Microsoft believe at these topological qubits um, and laser optics, for example, the quantum computer in China was, was light-based and people at the, uh, in Japan, for example, are working a lot in this, in this kind of technology. And there are other kinds of approaches, which are, um, they might consider sacrificing the quantumness in order to get something working right away, straight out of the box. And how is that possible? Well, they use the same framework of Cubo and then try to address it with um, tailored hardware, regardless if it takes advantage or not from quantum mechanics. So we have seen approaches where people are addressing icing or cubo problems more efficiently with a specialized hardware. So we have graphical processing units, tensor processing units. Uh, we have a special chips, so complementarity metal oxide semiconductors. Oscillator based computing is computing through light. Digital annealers, so an implement, a digital implementation of, of, the, um, of the quantum annealer, uh, the people at Japan 
trust this kind of technology a lot. So there are alternatives in the case that you don't want to get into quantum and you want to tackle this right away using the same framework of Cubo. So this brings me to this slide where um, you start, I started this presentation by showing you that through discrete nonlinear optimization, basically you can address any practical problem. Then I'm telling you that there are methods to solve Cubos efficiently, either through quantum computing or through other specialized hardware. So how do I connect these two ideas? And this is the part where uh, I will save a lot of time by Elizabeth's talk because she went through all the, ser all the different steps that you would need to take to transform a discrete optimization problem into a cube. So if you have continuous variables, you can discretize them. If you have integer variables, you can binarize them. If you have nonlinear equations, you can quadratize them, write them as quadratics. If you have con constraints, you can penalize them. And that should suffice for you to represent your discrete nonlinear optimization problem as a cube. Now, there are several caveats around this. Most of them have to do with the problem size growth. So you saw that the problem, suddenly this RSA 100 grew into a huge cubo, right? And well, we don't have the hardware to tackle those yet. Uh, and then if you are coming from the optimization field, you know that penalizing and softening constraints is a problematic issue. And you usually don't like doing that, right? Because how do you come up with the, with the penalization factor? Uh, sometimes the, the optimizer might cheat. So my proposal here um, is, well, we heard about these decomposition algorithms, right? Why don't we use the knowledge that we have from decomposition algorithms and now try to break down problems such that one of the sub pieces becomes a cubo that we can easily, well, easily now, more efficiently address with a specialized hardware. This is not a new idea, right? People uh, all over the place have been starting to look into these kind of ideas because it just makes sense, right? Um, if time allows, and I don't know if it does, um, I will go into one of the methods that we propose at CME. And I already showed the, the, the left part of this slide. Now the right part of this slide presents another classical method, which is based on computational algebraic geometry. This kind of method, um, it is quite interesting because as the other classical methods, is all, it also has this global convergence guarantees. There are very, very few implementations out there in compared to the super efficient codes of branch and bound, but it has this very interesting feature on complexity, which is called polynomial oracle complexity once you have a test set. So let me, let me clear this out and try to motivate what we did. So say that you're solving an integer program with this equality constraint, AX equals B. So you have four variables, two constraints. And if I project this thing onto the X1, X2 uh, plane, you can see that each one of these points is a feasible point, is a solution of this system of linear equations, right? So if I have an initial feasible solution, let's say I start at this corner over here, I have an oracle that compares objective functions between any two points, right? And I have this set of directions, G1, G2, G3, that satisfy certain conditions. I'll, I'll tell them later. I can solve an optimization problem as follows. If I have a convex objective, these three directions will always point me towards another point that improves the objective function. And if I reach a point where none of those directions point me towards a better, another better feasible point, I will be sitting at the global optical solution. How does that work? So, I'll, and these directions, they only depend on the, on the constraint. So let's say that I have this objective. I want to be as close as possible to the center of the circle, right? This is convex, certainly. And I start over here using these three directions. I know that the best step is to take G1 three steps up. So I get all the way up here. At this point, I ask again, where should I go? And I take G2. So 
Here, at this final point, I ask whether taking a step in G1, G2, G3 makes sense. It doesn't improve my objective in any direction. I can guarantee you that this is the global optimal solution. And I can also tell you that the number of steps that you're going to take is going to be polynomial with respect of this, is going to grow polynomially with respect of the size of the problem. So at this point, you might want to stop me and say, wait a sec. Combinatorial optimization problems, they are MP. So unless P equals MP, this cannot be true. And I will respond with the fact that the complexity of this method is finding these three directions, which obviously can not only be three, but can be several more in, in practice, right? What we did is pose, and this is actually a reason why there are not many efficient codes out there because computing this is really hard classically. And that's the point where we at CMU said, okay, why don't we use a quantum annealer to compute these directions? Then we can sort of tackle this complexity using quantum methods and a decomposition algorithm. So um, we can go through the details, but just to wrap up here, if the matrix has a special structure, you don't even need a quantum annealer. You can solve this analytically. And this structure happens to appear in many practical, in many practical problems. When we implemented this on a completely classical framework, we were able to obtain 100x improvement with respect to this Roby, which is one of the leading technologies to address these problems. And in practice, for chemical engineering, we like this because this shows the energy of dope super uh, semiconductors, molecular conformational energy, but people in machine learning or facility location or finance are also interested in this kind of well-structured problems. So uh, to wrap up, I think that there is certainly a potential of looking into quantum algorithms, even if quantum computers don't end up working, which who knows, right? Uh, and the reason is, as I just showed you in the previous slide, looking from a new perspective in this optimization problems might lead to advances on the classical optimization realm, right? And again, any advance in trying to address these problems pays off because of the many applications that we're dealing with. So I think that it makes sense for us to try to tackle these problems, looking at it from a point of view of quantum computing. And I, my claim is that decomposition makes sense, right? That you should use the right tool for the right task. Um, another thing, I'm, I'm very interested in energy, right? I, I think that, that that's one of the applications that I want to end up spending uh, the rest of my career. Basically, we need better models and better models are harder to solve. Therefore, if we work on solving these problems more efficiently, we're gonna make a bigger impact. And understanding this kind of resources becomes crucial for practical purposes, right? So uh, last but not least here, I have uh, four, four conclusions, but more importantly is if you like, uh, I needed to go through this extremely quickly. So I, I do apologize, but we did design a full course on quantum integer programming at Carnegie Mellon, being taught in collaboration with the people from the School of Business, which happened to be the integer programmers at, at Carnegie Mellon, the engineering uh, uh, college, and colleagues at NASA. The, the material for this course was supported by Amazon Bracket and by the University Space Research Association. It was not only used for our students, but also for the Air Force Research Laboratory. and not only that, we also, uh, looking around, the, this kind of material was not very widely available. Uh, I don't wanna claim we were the first course because there might have been another one, but at least we couldn't find another one. Therefore, we made all the recordings, all the codes, and all the notes freely available online. So if you like this topic of applying optimization into, of applying, sorry, quantum computing ideas into combinatorial optimization, please feel free to visit the material that we have prepared for you. And I really look forward to answer any questions that you might have.